This is Professor Meyer. I'm going to talk to you about the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. So your spinal cord is like the interstate. So you're sending information up to the brain and getting information back down from the brain. When you are studying this particular chapter, remember to go over lab material as well, especially over the spinal cord and spinal nerves. Your expected learning outcomes is your guideline. So again, we are not going over 100% in this chapter. So make sure that you take a look at these learning, up, uh, learning outcomes. Let's look at the functions of the spinal cord. So one of the primary ones is conduction. So you're sending information up and down the spinal cord. This is going to be white matter. So this is myelinated axons, and it is for speed. The ascending tracks are carrying information about your sensations, and they're going up to your brain. Descending tracks are carrying motor information, and they're primarily going to your skeletal muscles. Another primary function of the spinal cord is integration. So you... Um, put in information from different sources and your spinal cord can actually make a decision on what it should do. This is going to be the gray matter of your spinal cord. Some other functions of the spinal cord would be uh, locomotion. So basically it's coordinating repetitive motions for walking. Um, you need your brain for starting to walk and adjustments to walking, but the actual sequence of movements, you only need your spinal cord. And then finally, uh, your spinal cord is used for reflexes. This is going to be very important for your posture, for coordination, for protecting the body. And we also use those to help diagnose in certain disorders. So let's start looking at the anatomy. So this is a cylinder, comes from the brain stem. So the lowest part of your, or the most inferior part of your brain stem is the medulla. Goes through um, the foramen magnum of the occipital bone, and it goes only down to L1 and L2. So it doesn't extend all the way down through your sacrum to the tailbone. The growth of your spinal cord stops around uh, age five, even though the vertebra may continue growing. You have 31 pairs of spinal nerves from the spinal cord. So if we looked at your spinal cord, it ends approximately, approximately here. And then what continues down are going to be the dorsal and ventral roots of the lowermost part of your spinal cord. Your spinal cord is covered with the meninges. These are three connective tissue membranes that are both around the brain and the spinal cord. So from the most superficial, you have the dura mater, the arachnoid, and usually the dura and the arachnoid are back to back. And then the pia mater is actually on the spinal cord. The space above the meninges is the epidural space. And um, oftentimes, this is where you can put injections of anesthesia. There is no epidural space around your brain. It's only around your spinal cord. In the subarachnoid uh, space, you're going to have cerebral spinal fluid. So if you have to do a spinal tap, and this is where you want to take some cerebral spinal fluid to analyze it, you want to do the puncture below where your spinal cord ends. So you can see here on this vertebra, this is L4 and L5. So this is way below where your spinal cord ends. You'll take a very sharp needle. It has to go through this connective tissue, this thick connective tissue in between the bone, and then penetrate the dura and the arachnoid to get to the subarachnoid space. If we look at this, your spinal cord completely surrounded by your vertebra. Here you have your dura mater, 
uh, right next to it is going to be the arachnoid. They, you have this space, the subarachnoid space with, with cerebral spinal fluid, and then actually on the spinal cord is going to be the pia mater. So you can see this is pretty well protected. Now, sometimes uh, you will have a congenital defect, and then this vertebra does not completely enclose the spinal cord. So this is called spina bifida. And so it may be one or more of the vertebra that fails to completely enclose your spinal cord. And so what we see here on this baby, this is part of the dura mater. It's been pushed out of this area, this weak area that is that didn't have the vertebra, and it is filled with cerebral spinal fluid, and it may also have some of the dorsal and ventral roots. So what we find is, with spina bifida that there may be a connection with a lack of folic acid in the mother. So now what we do uh, tell young women is that if you are planning on becoming pregnant, start your prenatal vitamins as early as possible, and this will help prevent spina bifida in your child. All right, in chapter 13, we spend most of our time on white matter uh, instead of gray matter. We only have one slide on the gray matter. In 14, when we look at the brain, we're going to spend most of our time on gray matter and very little on white matter. So the gray matter in your spinal cord is this big letter H. You can see it looks like a butterfly. Okay. And so you have horns of the gray matter. So you can call them posterior or dorsal, and you have anterior or you could call it ventral horns. The reason why they're gray, there's no myelin on it. So this is the cell bodies, the dendrites, unmyelinated axons, and of course the synapses. The gray commissure is this connection um, little bridge from one side of the spinal cord to the other. The hole in the middle is your central canal and you have cerebral spinal fluid flowing in there. In the thoracic region, you have extra horns and so you have the lateral horns. Those are where you're going to see the sympathetic nervous system come from. Now let's look at the white matter. So the white matter is myelinated axons. And so this um, is going to be arranged in columns or funiculi. And you have three pairs. You have the posterior or dorsal, lateral, and the anterior, or you could call it ventral columns. Those are going to be consisting of tracts. So we use a collection of axons we use the term tracks for the central nervous system. The same thing, a collection of axons that are in the peripheral nervous system, we call those nerves. So on your spinal cord, we're going to be looking at these tracks. The good thing is that you do not have to know all the separate names and where the ascending and descending tracks are. Just realize that um, within a tract, they usually have the, um, the neurons have a, a similar origin, a destination, and, and function. What you do need to know are certain definitions. You know that need to know the difference between ascending tracts and descending tracts. You need to understand what the term decausation means, which is crossing over the midline to the opposite side. You need to know the terms contralateral and ipsilateral. So those are going to come into play when we talk about reflexes. Contralateral lateral means you go to the opposite side. Ipsilateral means you, you stay on the same side of your spinal cord. So let's look at the generalities on this. Ascending tracts are going to carry sen sensory signals up the spinal cord you're going to be using three neurons in a row. Okay, So your first neuron detects the stimulus. You're going to send it into the spinal cord, 
uh, or up to the brain stem. And then it's going to synapse with the second neuron. That second neuron goes to the thalamus. Now the thalamus is part of your brain. It's your gateway. So all sensations are going to go through the thalamus and the thalamus decides where that sensation needs to go. So the third neuron goes from the thalamus to the correct area of your cerebral cortex. At some point during this, you're going to cross over to the other side. So you have dequisition. So you look on here, your first order neuron, that's your first one. Your, it synapses with your second order. The second order actually is crossing over to the opposite side. That travels to your thalamus here. And then your third order will go to the correct area of your cerebral cortex. Let's look at the descending tracks. So those are carrying motor signals. And um, they, there's only two motor neurons in a row. The first one is going to be the upper motor neuron, and that synapses with the lower motor neuron. If we're looking at somatic motor neurons, and so remember somatic is going to skeletal muscles, the crossing over, decosation, occurs in the medulla. Let's look at two um, disorders of the motor neurons. We're going to look specifically at somatic motor neurons. And we'll look at polio and we'll look at ALS. Both of those, since you're destroying the somatic motor neurons, your skeletal muscles are going to atrophy. So the first one, polio, is caused by a virus. This was um, uh, horrible in the late 40s, early 50s. We had epidemics of polio and um, crippled over 35,000 uh, people a year, mostly children, before we uh, developed the vaccine in 1955. So it spread by contaminated water, destroys the motor neurons in the brain stem and in the spinal cord. Um, and it progresses from just muscle pain and some loss of reflexes uh, to paralysis. The muscles start to atrophy and in many cases uh, leads to respiratory arrest because remember with breathing you need skeletal muscles such as the diaphragm and usually um, uh, respiratory arrest lasts for at least a week and then as you recuperate, you may or may not uh, recover function from your skeletal muscles. So um, as I said, in the 1950s, uh, early 50s, uh, 35,000 people a year in the United States alone uh, were crippled. Uh, polio now is endemic in Afghanistan, Nigeria, and Pakistan. Um, the reason why we're talking about polio is that even though we have a vaccine for it, we are now seeing a brand new virus that is very much like polio that is affecting children. And so we don't know very much about it, but we do know it works, um, it attacks those somatic motor neurons. This is a shot of the iron lungs that were required for um, especially children that went into respiratory arrest. So they would need an iron lung for at least a week until they recovered function of their skeletal muscles. So this is a shot of an epidemic in California in 1953. The other disorder is ALS. And so with the ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, the uh, motor neurons are being destroyed and the muscles are beginning to atrophy. What you're seeing is some sclerosis or scarring of the lateral regions of the spinal cord. 
This is being caused by an excess of a neurotransmitter. It's accumulating into very toxic levels and causing this uh, sclerosis. So different patients will show different progressions, uh, rate of progressions of ALS. Remember, since this is only affecting motor neurons and it's somatic motor neurons, it's not affecting sensations, it's not affecting your intelligence, so the gray matter of your brain. All right, so let's look at spinal nerves. So when we look at nerves, we're looking at the peripheral nervous system. It is a collection of axons. So if we're looking at this, you can see this is one axon. So this axon is bundled up in a fascicle, and then all these fascicles are bundled up as a nerve. So some of these axons, they're carrying sensations. So it's going into your spinal cord. When it gets to the roots, it's going to go on the dorsal root. So it separates out and sensations will go on the, the posterior or dorsal root to get into your um, spinal cord. Motor will come out ventral. And then so some of these are actually axons that are carrying information um, that is motor going to primarily your skeletal muscles. So these are called mixed nerves since some of them are sensory and some of these are motor. Now remember when we look at this, the vertebra has been taken off on this diagram. So the vertebra would be right about here. Everything that's inside of the vertebra, we call these branches here roots. And then outside, these are rami, and the largest ramus is going to be your spinal nerve. So your nerve, remember, is an organ composed of lots of axons uh, bound together by connective tissue. They're mixed, so you have both sensory and you have motor. Now, these axons are going to be surrounded by Schwann cells. You had to know two things about the Schwann cells. The two parts, it's the neurolemma and the myelin sheath. So refresh your memory about those. If, that's, uh, if you've forgotten about it, this is chapter 12. Around the outside of the Schwann cell, you will have a connective tissue covering. That's your endoneurium. And this is going to electrically insulate it. Um, that sh should sound a little bit familiar. We talked about the endomyceum, which is a connective tissue wrapping around one skeletal muscle cell. Around a fascicle of axons, you're going to have the perineurium. And around the entire nerve, you have the epineurium. Again, with skeletal muscles, we had the endomyceum, the perimyceum, and the epimyceum. So blood vessels are going to go through these connective tissue coverings, providing oxygen, uh, nutrients, and carrying away the wastes. The word ganglion, remember, is a collection of cell bodies. So it's the cell bodies of your neurons. This is outside the central nervous system. It would be called a nucleus if it was in the central ner nervous system. And so this is going to be covered in uh, by the endoneurium. You had to know the posterior root ganglion. Um, in lab. So this is um, going to be sensory neurons and remember that these are going to be unipolar neurons. The other ganglion that you had to know from lab is going to be the sympathetic chain ganglion. 
So if we looked at the ganglion, so we're going to be looking here at the dorsal root ganglion. Here's my axon going along, going towards my central nervous system. And you'll notice that off of that, that is where the cell body from a stalk. So this is a unipolar. So you have this whole collection of those cell bodies in this ganglion. On the anterior root or ventral root, this is motor. So these are axons going in the opposite direction. The cell body and dendrites of those are going to be here in the gray matter of your, um, your spinal cord. Your spinal nerves, you got 31 pairs and they're all mixed nerves. So that means you have motor and sensory. So you have eight cervical spinal nerves. Remember, you only have seven cervical vertebra. So the first cervical spinal nerve is actually coming out between your occipital bone and the atlas. The other ones are coming out of the intervertebral foramina. You have 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, and then one for the coccyx. Each spinal nerve is formed from two roots. Remember, the roots are inside of the vertebra. And so the posterior root is only carrying sensory information. And then the ganglion, those are going to be the cell bodies or the somas of the sensory neurons. So they're going to enter the uh, posterior horn of the cord. That's where it synapses. The ventral root is motor, so they're coming out. Now at the very bottom of your um, spinal cord, uh, at the inferior end, you will have dorsal and ventral roots that they are running kind of downwards. That is called the cauda equina. So literally, it means horse's tail. So if we look at this, you can see this is the end of your spinal cord, but, and it ends right around, it looks right around L1. So these are dorsal and ventral roots that are going downwards, and then they go out, forming your L1, L2, L3, L4, going down through the sacral as well. Okay. Another view of the same thing, the cauda equina. outside of the vertebra, then the nerve is going to divide into rami. Ramus is singular, rami is plural. So the biggest branch is the anterior or the ventral ramus. And so in the thoracic, this is your intercostal nerves. The other regions, they're going to make the plexus that you learned in lab. You're going to have a small branch, a posterior ramus, and that's going to go backwards. That's going to go towards your the muscles and the joints and the, the region of your spine and your skin and the, on your back. You have in the thoracic region the rami communicantis, and so this is going to have the sympathetic nerve fibers. There's actually a small branch that also will come back. Uh, meningeal branch that re-enters and goes to the meninges. So looking at this, remember these all on the outside are going to be rami. Okay. Inside, these are going to be roots. And so you have the posterior going to the back. You have the anterior. This is the one that will make the plexus, or if you're in the thoracic region, the intercostal nerves. Um, you have the rami communicantis with the sympathetic ganglion. Again, looking at the same thing, coming out of your vertebra, here is the communicating rami communicantis. The, the largest ramus here is going to be the ventral, the one going towards the back. This is going to be the posterior ramus. Same thing here. All right, so chickenpox, which is very common childhood disease um, caused by a virus, that virus stays with you. 
So it is uh, hiding in the posterior uh, root ganglion. And so usually it's kept in check by your immune system. However, it can come out uh, as shingles. So it's the same virus and um, occurs when your immune system is suppressed. A lot of times because you are stressed and so now your immune system doesn't want to work quite as well. So it's common after age 50, but it can actually occur even in a, um, a young person. And so that uh, virus comes out and travels down where the sensory nerves causes a, a very painful um, vesicles on your skin. All right, spinal plexus. So your nerve plexus. You have five nerve plexus. The four major ones are what you have to know for lab. You have the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus. Uh, remember in the thoracic region, there is no plexus. It is going to be your intercostal nerves. Then a little bit lower down, you have the lumbar plexus, the sacral plexus, and you actually have a very, very small one for the Cossacks. Um, and this only one nerve is actually coming from this particular plexus. Remember that your spinal nerves are mixed so you're going to have sensations going in. The major sensations that are going in are carrying information from your muscle, your skin, your bones, your joints. When we look at the word proprioception, this is information about your body position and what kind of movements you're making. So this is really important, especially to maintain your balance and to coordinate your movements. The motor function is usually going to, um, uh, to your skeletal muscle. That's the major motor function with these nerve plexus. So let's start with the cervical plexus. And this is supplying uh, mostly your muscles in your shoulder and your neck. Um, the only nerve you need to know from the cervical plexus is the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm. Irritation of that phrenic nerve is what causes hiccups. They have found that in children that hiccups can actually stimulate brain waves. Haven't found that uh, any kind of use in, in an adult. Um, if you damage the cord above C3, uh, you do not have any kind of connection to the phrenic nerves, and so it causes respiratory arrest. But at C3, C4, and C5, you have a connection going down to the phrenic nerve. And so you are still able to breathe on your own. The brachial plexus is going to your upper limb. Um, you had to know four nerves. Axillary nerve, that's going to your deltoid. Radial nerve to the extensors of your forearm and wrist. The ulna nerve, only one muscle you had to know for that, that's the flexor carpi ulnaris. And the median nerve is all the other flexors and the pronator. So remember on this, it is not only you don't, uh, it's not just memorizing which muscle, you should also refresh your memory what kind of movements that these nerves are initiating. Your lumbar plexus, you have two nerves to know. The femoral nerve is to the anterior thigh. So this is where the quadriceps. Refresh your memory what kind of movements the quadriceps are doing. And then the obturator nerve is uh, to the medial thigh. You had the uh, three um, muscles there for the adduction of your, of your thighs, of your legs. The sacral plexus is uh, two basic nerves. One is the largest nerve in the human body, which is the sciatic nerve. So this is going to the posterior thigh, um, going to where your hamstrings are. In the popliteal area, it branches into the tibial and the common fibular nerves. 
and then the other nerve is the pudendal nerve and that is going to help control the external anal sphincter and the external urethral sphincter. Some injuries to know with the radial nerve um, you can have what's called crutch paralysis. So if you're not using crutches correctly you can actually put pressure in your armpit where the radial nerve is running through and um, actually your your arm will fall asleep and so that's your crutch paralysis the sciatic nerve is um, uh, a common injury sciatica is that uh, inflammation of the sciatic nerve very sharp pain going down your leg and maybe up uh, up your back as well. Most of those are caused by a herniated disc or osteoporosis. All right, so let's look at somatic reflexes. So these are going to be involuntary and um, they can be um, somatic or they can be uh, visceral. Okay, these reflexes. So all reflexes have um, certain characteristics. So reflexes, they require stimulation. So they're not spontaneous. You've got to actually stimulate it to get a reaction. They tend to be very quick. Okay, so they have very, very few neurons. Um, reflexes are involuntary. Even if you're looking at skeletal muscles, it's still the reflex is involuntary. And then they should work pretty much the same way every time, which is why we can use reflexes to help with diagnosis with certain disorders. So when we look at reflexes, uh, somatic reflexes are with the scale, skeletal muscles. Autonomic reflexes are going to be using glands and looking at heart muscle and smooth muscle. So your somatic reflex arc, your pathway, you start out with the receptors, go on sensory nerve fibers, go into a, an integrating center so we're looking at gray matter here come out motor and goes to the effectors and in this case our effectors since we're looking at somatic we're looking at skeletal muscles so this is looking at um, a reflex a typical reflex and this one happens to be uh, a stretch reflex so this is where muscles, uh, when they're stretched, they kind of fight back and they, they contract. And uh, this helps with stabilizing joints and balancing um, tension in your extensors and flexors. So your most um, probably famous one that most people have heard of is the knee jerk or patellar reflex. It is very, very quick. Um, there's only one synapse in this. So you have a sensory neuron and you have a motor neuron and that's it. And so they synapse in gray matter. So uh, we're going to first uh, look at the patellar. So the patellar, you have your little reflex hammer. You are not hitting the nerve on this. What you're doing is you're tapping on the tendon. That tendon, when you tap on it, will actually stretch your quadriceps, okay? And so this is detected. You're going to send the message straight into your spinal cord. So you can see here where the synapse is. And it comes back. It goes back to the same muscle and you contract that same muscle. This is why your leg extends because you're contracting the quadriceps. Now, at the same time as you're contracting the quadriceps, it's going to go down here to your hamstrings and it's going to tell it to relax because you don't want your quadriceps and your hamstrings both contracting at the same time. Two other reflexes that you need to know is one is the flexor 
reflex, and the other one is the crossed extension. These are protective reflexes. So the flexor is very quick, and this is where you are pulling away from some, some kind of stimulus that's damaging. So like for instance, you touching a hot stove, you will immediately jerk away and you'll jerk away even before you realize you've been burned. So remember flexion is you're putting a bend in your body. In this case, you can see this person has stepped on a piece of glass and that information goes into your spinal cord comes right back to your muscles and you do a massive contraction and pull that leg away from the damage. This is ipsilateral, so it stays on the same side of your spinal cord. Along with the flexor, you usually have a crossed extension reflex. And so when you are sending the message to do flexion of the, the limb, the arm or leg that's being damaged, you'll send a message across to the other side of your spinal cord and to the other limb. And this is how you're going to extend that limb and maintain your balance. Because it goes to the other side of your spinal cord, this is called a contralateral reflex. So the flexor and the crossed extension reflexes are examples of protective reflexes. So this is the end of chapter 13. So go back, review over it. Make sure that you also review over lab information that covers the spinal cord as well as the spinal, spinal nerves.